Phoenix LeFay is a professional reader, root worker, teacher, and ritualist. She has been practicing witchcraft for almost 30 years. She weaves a tapestry of traditions, including eclectic witchcraft, Wicca, Druidry, and more. She's the owner of an esoteric goddess shop called Milk and Honey, and she's the author of several books, including What is Remembered Lives, Walking in Beauty, Witches, Heretics, and Warrior Women, Life Ritualized, co-authored with Guion, Guion Raven, and her newest book, A Witch's Guide to Creating and Performing Rituals That Actually Work. Guion Raven is a tattooed pagan, writer, traveler, musician, cook, kitchen witch, a cult shop owner, and teacher. Although initiated in three magical traditions, Guion describes his practice as virtually anything that celebrates the wild, sensuous, living, breathing, dancing, ecstatic, divine experiences of this lifetime. Born and raised in London, England, he now resides in Northern California and shares space with redwood trees, the Pacific Ocean, and his beloved partner. Phoenix and Guion, welcome to Witchlet. Thank Hello, you. How's it going? Yeah, it's uh, Phoenix. is nice to have you back, and Guion, it's nice to have you on the show. Um, so this episode will be a little bit different for folks. Uh, we'll still start with our same question, but we'll mix it up a little bit. So uh, our first question for everybody on the show is why write in this time of, you know, all of these different ways to communicate. But for the two of you. Why write together since you have done that as a couple, which seems amazing yeah. to me. <laughs> <laughs> you want to start with that, Guyan? Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, why write together? So I'd love to give you a really romantic literary answer. You know, like it's always been our passion to craft a tone together. But the simple fact of the matter is, we were driving to Tucson and we were chatting about an idea and the book just kind of sprung out of, you know, the boredom of driving for 14 hours from where we live to Tucson, Arizona. And by the time we came back, we said, we should do this. And so that's really the where it came from. So um, we do enjoy each other's writing. We do enjoy reading each other's writing. Writing together, however, uh, is uh, is a completely different experience. So I'll leave it there for now, <laughs> Phoenix. Well, I think we also, you know, we we met when we worked together in a corporate environment, and we often worked on projects together, and that, that's been kind of a continual thing in our relationship. Like we we both teach in the reclaiming tradition of witchcraft, so we teach a lot together. We've been um, on witch camp teaching teams together. We run a coven together. So I think that we do well when we have a project together. And so the book was just like, we were both writing different books and in chatting and brainstorming on different things that would be interesting to have a book about, we sort of came up with this idea together, but it was also really great to have a project to do together. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, at least for us as a couple, having something to create together is an important part of our relationship. So, Gwen, you kind of hinted that it might not have been all um, rose petals and glamour, this project. <laughs> mm-hmm. So what was, yeah. and what, I, I mean, so you got the idea on a car trip. So how did it unfold from there? Like, how did you guys decide, you know, who was going to write what? How were you, were you going to write chapter by chapter? Like, what, what, how did you decide to divvy up the labor and did that work once you made that decision? <laughs> That's a good uh-huh. question. <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. Um, so <laughs> I'll give you my perspective on it. So once we began, and by the way, the the book we're talking about is Life Ritualized, right? So it's mm-hmm. this book about the various rituals that we go through or can choose to go through. So it's part rites of passage. Um, you know, we all go through certain rites of passage in our life. So we were talking about rites of passage. Then we were talking about the rituals that commemorate those rites of passage. And then we began thinking, well, what are all the rites of passages that we never talk about? What are the milestones in our modern life um, that either our sort of general, uh, you know, uh, Western or American culture doesn't really celebrate anymore or memorialize? And so, and then we said, 
well, what other celebrations, rites of passage or rituals would we want to celebrate or commemorate? And so it sort of began as a, a long list. We started with the big ones, you know, birth and marriage and death or partnership, if not marriage, but, you know, sort of started there, um, childbirth. And then we said, well, what about, you know, graduating high school? What about getting driver's license? What about empty nesting? Uh, you know, when kids move out, what about retirement? And we began to sort of create this list of moments in uh, our lives, some of which we've gone through ourselves and some of which are still ahead for us, right? And really began to think about there aren't a lot of ways to memorialize or commemorate many of those. So we ended up with about 60 different rituals or rites of passage. And then we started looking at them and Phoenix said, I'm really passionate about these two. And I would say, well, I really have a uh, an aching to write about that, or I feel like I've got something to say about these two. And we began to sort of divvy it up. In some cases, we'd written blogs or other pieces that were sort of sitting in the background that hadn't made it into a book yet or hadn't uh, made it onto a blog and said, ah, oh, that might be a great way to expand that. And then we just kept talking about it and talking about it and flushing out the ideas. And there were absolutely passages that I thought I was going to write that Phoenix said, you know what? I just, I have a notion. Let me go with it. And then there were pieces that we very much collaborated on. Every portion of the book mm -hmm. we collaborated on. So even if it was just me editing a sentence or Phoenix going in and changing a paragraph around, everything was collaborative. But there are definitely pieces that were I don't know, 95% me and 95% Phoenix. And then there were parts that were very much 50-50. I think we also looked at our life experiences because it's kind of, it's hard to write about something that you've never been through, you know? So, you know, like I've, uh, although I'm AFAB, I've never had a miscarriage. And Guian had been in a relationship where there was a miscarriage. So he actually wrote that section because I didn't have a relationship to that experience. And he did. Uh, so, you know, that that kind of thing. We also, the only con uh, contributor to the book besides each of us is Misha Magdalene, who wrote the ritual for coming out because mm -hmm. they're a trans woman and neither of us can, uh, we've never experienced that. So we really wanted to make sure that it was a, a voice that could share not only uh, a, a really solid ritual, but have a personal backing to that ritual. And to be clear, both of us have come out but neither yeah. of us have come out as a trans person. So it was right. very important for us right. to have a trans person speak so that voice. That voice. Right? Yeah. 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 And I think her passage yeah. in the book and both in the passages that you all share your personal stories. I, for me, I mean, just reading it cover to cover, like, you know, for an interview was the most interesting part to read because it, you know, reading about the ritual, I think it's more like you would usually go to that when you need it. Right. It's, it's more like yeah. a reference book, but that yeah. addition of those stories made it it's just so much more personal to think about it in that way. And it was clear that, you know, the, these were thoughtful because they were lived experience. Yeah. Yeah. That was one of the challenges, you know, as an author and as a, you know, a, a public person, all be that in a very, you know, small fish pond of uh, the world of witchcraft and paganism and the occult. But um, as a public person, there was discussion about how much did we reveal about ourselves as individuals? How much did we reveal about ourselves as a couple? Um, what experiences did we share? Generally speaking, there wasn't a lot left on the on the editing table when it came to transparency. We really mm -hmm. um, felt like to make the book read as authentically as possible, we had to tell, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly stories, you know. And and so um, yeah, and that that's actually where in we talked about the challenges. Um, Phoenix and I write very differently, yes. both <laughs> in our voice uh, and in our style. Process. Our process, our process. is diametrically opposed. 
<laughs> well, I was going to ask about that. So we can just go there now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I need chaos around me. Like, and maybe because I probably have ADHD, who the hell knows, but like I need the TV on in the background and like every light on in the house and I need a snack and three drinks and I need the, I need like stimulation and Guion is like the exact opposite where he needs like silence and the room must be clean and there can't even be like dishes in the house or mail in the mailbox that needs to be picked up. He needs like everything to be in its place. So we did a lot of writing apart from each other. I would do my pieces and he would do his pieces and then we'd have these moments of coming together. And we actually ended up having a, a writer's retreat, quote unquote, where we went up to Mendocino County and, and stayed in a little uh, breakfast Airbnb place and um, just dedicated a full three days to working on this project together. And then we would take breaks and go to the beach or you know go in the hot tub or get something to eat. But it was a way where we could both sort of have the energetic that we needed to focus on the project. And that was kind of nice. That Like a lot of the writing we did together was done at that time but you know we both we just really need different things to, to be creative yeah. so that was interesting and what's <laughs> really funny with that is that in our like in our daily interactions like the way we interact with each other as collaborators and as a couple and as witches and ritualists and teachers and priestesses like we as phoenix said we have lots of ways that we work with each other I'm not um, the person that has to have everything perfect no. and and quiet and still, except for when I'm writing. I, I'll give you an insight. Like I'll sit down and I'll say, if I want to write a ritual, uh, this portion of the book is about, um, I don't know, uh, losing a pet, right? And how we memorialize losing a pet. And I would look at some pictures of my dog and then I'd get up and I'd go into the other room and I'd, stroke her collar you know she's left us now so i'd stroke her collar i put my fingers in her paw print that we have a cast of and then i realized that there were dishes in the sink and so i think well before i start writing i should probably get the dishes done and then i would do the dishes and then i would think well i'm hungry and if i'm gonna be hungry i'm gonna make more dishes so i'll eat then i'll do the dishes then i'll go back and i'll start writing it was this endless level of procrastination which is the only time he does the dishes so maybe we should write another book <laughs> that's so not true uh but then i would sit down and an hour had gone by and then i would go down the rabbit hole and then phoenix would come in and say hey i have an idea and i'd be like no! you know and then i'd have to start all over again so my process was really really different i don't know how phoenix can uh like she says, watch TV, listen to a podcast and type all at the same time. She'll write 10,000 words in 10 minutes. It seems like I write 10 <laughs> words in 10,000 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't know. My process is somewhere in between there. I mean, sometimes my life is chaotic just by accident. Um, yeah. But I do better with a, a little bit of routine. So I, I kind of feel you both in that. Uh, although yeah. I do wonder if like going off to a monastery for a month might get books faster. So, yeah. We have a dear, dear friend that once or twice a year goes off on a two or three week writer's retreat. She's done this for years. And I think that's where we got the idea, but it really was fantastic because we were away from all of those typical distractions um, you know, there were no Amazon packages arriving at the front door. There was no family members dropping by unexpectedly. Um, and we also made a commitment. You know, that was one of the key things is we had a commitment. We're going to write this book in this time, in this place. Uh, and, and out it came. Sorry, the podcat was getting chaotic. So, <laughs> so cute. Yeah, he, he thinks it's his show. Um <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I, oh, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that I've talked, I've had the privilege of talking to quite a few writers kind of in this space and then just, you know, writers and uh, through, you know, friends and things. And the one thing I think is universal is that there's nothing universal about how, what people need to write and what their process is. Yeah. is I mean, that seems to be the only thing that we all have in common is that we don't. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And then there's those bursts of creativity, you know, so again, for all of my, you know, gnashing of teeth and not getting things done. 
all of a sudden I'd sit down and 5,000 words would pop out just like that. Right. And um, yeah. So it, it, when the muse strikes, you just got to yeah. wait. Yeah. Yeah. 5,000 word day is a, a, that's a pretty sweet writing day. Yeah. That's um, a good day. <laughs> yeah. Um, so now that you've done this, do you think you would write another book together? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I think like we've talked about it, but then there's not been another topic that we've toyed with that felt like it stuck. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think I think if if the right subject happened, it could happen. I was going to say yes, definitely. So, <laughs> now I feel terrible. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, actually, I'd really like to write another book with Phoenix. And we have kicked around a few ideas um, of, of things that we would like to write. And again, what, you know, there's that old adage with writing, right? Like, write what you know. And so I think we look at, you know, really obvious topics are um, how to sustain a relationship within you know, the occult world, um, you know, where, where do we come together as, you know, two normal people that have a regular old kind of marriage that does the kind of things that marriages do. Uh, and also where, depending on the, the tradition where a, a high priest and a high priestess in one tradition, where teachers in other traditions, where speakers and writers and, you know, we've all, like I said, all these different personalities. And so being able to sort of balance that in a way and then finding what's challenging that. Another book that is on our mind without giving any uh, too many secrets away <laughs> is uh, we have a unique take on finances. Um, and uh, if you spend any amount of time in uh, the the pagan interwebs out there, you know, there's always these questions of everything should be free, nothing should be free, capitalism, consumerism, um, why does it cost so much to go to a festival, how come festivals don't make money, you know, like there's all these questions, right, around finances, and what's really interesting is that there are, I don't think everybody necessarily understands that there are people within our very small fish pond of people that make $5,000 a year and others that make $500,000 a year. Like, I think there is a common misconception that many pagans are poor and struggling, or the default is that it's a poor mm -hmm. and struggling. I don't know that that's necessarily true. And I also think that there's a there's a shadow around money, right? If we oh, don't sure. embrace shadow, um, we're not generally taught in this culture to understand how money works. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, um, many of us struggle with it. Uh, I know I certainly have for years and years. I was absolutely dirt poor growing up. Um, and, um, and so my relationship to money and finances, it took me probably 20 years longer than it should have to be able to actually make sense of my finances. So we think there might be a book in there. Mm -hmm. I, know, I feel like strangely, not that you're giving secrets away, but I feel like this topic has come up a lot just because I've talked to writers mm -hmm. and writers like pagans are often uh, not making the bulk of their money that way. <laughs> so oh, no, 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 I, think no. It, I think it's a topic. <laughs> no. I think it's a ripe topic. Let me put it that way. I think that's a ripe yeah. topic. Um, but no, that, that makes sense. So I guess one of the things I was thinking about, cause I've read, you know, the books that you've written individually. And so, you know, having done that and then read the book you wrote together, like I can kind of see how the threads come together, I guess. And obviously there will probably threads that come out of that. I mean, your most recent book, Phoenix is another book about ritual and, and planning yeah. rituals. Um, yeah. But I, I guess the thing I'm curious about is like when, when you are writing on your own separate projects, like how much do you look to each other like for cheerleading and critique and all of that in your process? Is it like write everything and then show it to you? Or are you guys kind of like back and forth as you're hashing books out? <laughs> this has been an evolving process. <laughs> so Phoenix's first book, uh, What Is Remembered Lives, I didn't see until it came out in print. 
I ha- I'm very um, delicate. <laughs> And I don't think people know that. I even joked with Heather, who's my acquisitions edit- editor at Llewellyn. Like, I come across as very like calm and confident, and I am calm, confident not so much, but I am very delicate. And especially with that first book, I just, I was mortified thinking someone was going to read it. <laughs> I was so excited that I had done this thing, and I was very proud of it. And I was very proud, especially of the god, the gods that I shared like my heart with, because it was such a deep process. But I was terrified that people were going to actually now read it. And I have a moment of that with every book. There is a moment, you know. There's the few books out there now, and at, with every one, I just. I have a moment of just feeling absolutely sick that someone's going to read this now. And, and because, you know, you're going to get judged. People are going to hate it. People are going to hate me and all those things can be expected. And it's, I like, logically I'm okay with that, but I'm not really okay with that. And so having Guion see it is like the first line of panic. (laughs) And And even if it's, Go ahead. Even if it sucked, Guion would be like, this is great. You're so great. I'm so proud of you. Cause he's, he is my biggest cheerleader. I'm just not good at asking for cheerleading, you know? Yeah. <laughs> in, my, in, in my day job. So I'm a business consultant and a lot of what I do is write marketing content and I work with marketers. And so I'm constantly looking at copy and editing it. So I have to be really careful when Phoenix does show me work, does she want me to read it as a reader or is she asking me to edit it, right? And so that's, and we we each have our own foibles, like in our language. I love to write run-on sentences that use the word and (laughs) repeatedly. You like to fancy yourself as Douglas Adams in pagan writing. Yeah, sure. (laughs) So I write with, a, a, you know, a, a humor and a twist. And like I said, I, lo- I, I, I love commas. Commas are wonderful, especially the ones from Oxford. But I really like um, ands. So I will say, you know, and Phoenix, and Victoria, and Guion instead of, you know, using commas mm-hmm. because it adds a rhythm and a meter to the way the sentence is. I write it less as prose and more as poetry, as if it were being spoken or orated. Uh, and so my writing style is different than Phoenix's writing style. Yeah. And I write, you've probably, if you've read any of my stuff, I write incredibly tangentially. So I will say today's topic is podcasts. Now, before we talk about podcasts, let's talk about the printing press, right? And, <laughs> and so it's this, uh, I sort of take a thread and we'll make a long story out of it. Where Phoenix, on the other hand, um, has the amazing skill of brevity with impact. <laughs> I I will take 10,000 words to say one thing. Phoenix can say five words to say 10 pages worth of stuff. So yeah. her challenge is expanding. My challenge is editing. But he yeah. also wants, like, when he's in his process, he will be like, can I just read you this thing? Oh, yeah. So it's almost like he once he writes something that he's really pleased with, he, he must share it immediately. So there's a lot of times I'll get called in to his office and he's like, I just need to read you this thing. I wrote this thing. I finally wrote this thing. <laughs> so, yeah, he, he's an immediate sharer and I'm like a never sharer. <laughs> <laughs> now, well, it's funny you were talking about like the the cadence and like commas and ands and, and that kind of thing. And I do wonder, uh, partly, so my husband, and I've said this a million times in the podcast and people are probably tired of hearing it. My husband's from Trinidad, but he went to basically an Anglican boys school. So he was, mm. you know, kind of English schooling. And yeah. um, the way that we approach language is so different. I mean, I, you know, I grew up in the States. So, so American standard English versus British standard English is yeah. kind of its own challenge. Yeah. And I do think that there is in British English, um, run on sentences are more of a thing. Like they're more accessible (laughs) in British English than they are in American English. And because I was mostly an English major and I read a lot of British literature, I too am guilty of run on sentences that are really a paragraph rather than a sentence Mm -hmm. so i feel i feel you on that but it is is something that has come up multiple times in our conversation about my right he writes too but he isn't he aside from a blog he he doesn't publish 
And um, he has said, y- you're taking on my bad habits. And I was like, mm, I think I had them already. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> In my brain, I think about, you know, there's kind of that formula of short sentence, short sentence, long sentence, short sentence, short sentence, long sentence. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, which is a pretty common device. Open up any book and you'll start to see that. And I just remember really back in my high school years, because I'm sort of actually rebellious. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, naturally rebellious is a euphemism for pain in an the asshole, butt. Quite frankly. Yeah. I'm yeah. <laughs> so, but um, I, for every teacher that would want us to diagram sentences and to write using you know perfectly crafted grammar i would show them an author that had changed something in writing and said well they didn't do it and they'd say well yes but i mean no no buts like the Mm -hmm. best books don't necessarily follow those devices and i think you know it's important to understand what the rules are so then you can break them or bend them or twist them yeah and i'm much more about that again i tend to write how i talk um uh, somebody that read one of my books recently said because they know me um they've met me a few times when they read the book they could hear my voice as they were writing it not just because they know how i speak and how i sound but the 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 lilt the cadence Mm -hmm. the timber of it you know it kind of matched the way i speak yeah I don't, I think that's true. I mean, for me as a reader, I think that's true of a lot of folks where I've either met them or I've heard them talk somewhere, yeah. you know, in the before times, like at a lecture or, you know, now on a podcast or something. But um, yeah, I, I, I probably am not a speed reader, partly for that reason, because I feel like I can hear their voice in my head and I want, it's almost like they're reading it to me instead of me reading it sometimes. Mm-hmm. But yeah. yeah. That makes sense. So like as readers yourselves, do you, do you kind of have similar taste or do you diverge there too? We diverge Mm. there too. (laughs) It's a Venn diagram. Uh, When it comes to occult stuff, we're pretty similar. Like we've read most of the same books, Yeah, you know, whether it's kind of the, you know, the, the, the classic books or, or what have you Um, in our, I would say in our like reading by choice rather than, you know, for vocation. Um, I love science fiction. I absolutely am mad for science fiction. And believe it or not, you know, those like summer novels he met, you know, they were walking down the beach together. They met, there was a dog and this wonderful thing happened <laughs> over the summer. I love like a good summer read, like those kind of like, um, you know, <laughs> 250 page books that you read while you're sitting around a pool or on vacation or something like that. Not that I'm really ever sitting around a pool or on vacation, <laughs> but I freaking love those books. Um, we no. went to England. <laughs> Yeah, no. <laughs> we, we went to England. Yeah, I have like a Nicholas Sparks year. cover in my brain right now. They can't get out. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's exactly it. And I tend to read a lot of books by women authors, like my fiction, except for science fiction. I, you know, I just grew up in a time where, like, I just don't like Ursula Guin's writing style. Um, and so that's kind of the, for many years, that was kind of the only option. That's not true today. Mm -hmm. But so like a lot of the science fiction books I've read were written in like the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. And so they weren't women's voices really, or not very popular women's voices, which is terrible. Um, but, um, yeah, most of the books that I read now for fun, fiction books tend to be written by women. Um, and I, I seek that out. And it's so different. It's so refreshing. It's so not the way I write, but it's the way I want to consume. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or, I don't like science fiction at all. <laughs> I like young adult fantasy. <laughs> and my favorite author is Stephen King. So uh, that we're very different when it comes to our fictional mm-hmm. choices. Yeah. 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 Phoenix, ha- I, I really tried to pick <laughs> Stephen King. Phoenix gave me 
a couple of Stephen King books to read and said, well, if you want to start with Stephen King, here's a great place to start. And I was like, oh, my God, this is so boring. I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure he's a wonderful man and obviously has sold a bajillion books. You know, like he could write something on a napkin and it would outsell my book. Well, at you this know. point in his career, sure. Absolutely. But I just keep trying to read his stuff. Uh, oddly enough, the only book that I've read cover to cover was Dolores Claiborne, which is a maudlin subject about a terrible abuse. For some reason, I was like, well, that one was pretty good. The rest of it, I just can't get into. Yeah, yeah I read a lot of yes. Stephen King when I was younger because my dad and my brothers all read a lot of Stephen King. But as yeah. I've gotten older, I find that I... I'm not a huge fan. Like, I feel like he gets yeah. away with a lot now that maybe a good editor could fix. Um, yeah, I'm probably get totally. slapped by Stephen King fans now. But um, <laughs> the thing I do think he is brilliant at and is a master of is the short story. I think he's mm -hmm, a fantastic yeah. short story writer and, yeah. you know, like a master craft in short story right. development. But yeah, yeah, it's um it's a struggle. But and, and I do like Ursula K. Le Guin. <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, she was kind of my introduction to women could write the weird, I guess. I mean, mm, there yeah, weren't a lot of yeah. there weren't a lot of science fiction writers who were women when I was younger. And right. I don't read a ton of science fiction, but I do read a lot of fantasy. And that was she was really yeah, cool. I, I love oh. a good fantasy book. Just add it. some fairies and a, a couple of sex scenes. I'm all about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just read uh, Piranesi by Suzanne uh, Clark. Clark. No, it's not Clark. Yeah, Suzanne Clark. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. That was brilliant. It's weird. It's strange. But you mentioned like writing the weird. That's a complete not mind bend of a book. It's fantastic. Um, and she also wrote the, um, was it The Strange Adventures of Dr. Norell and Mr. Someone or other? Oh, Someone. yeah. Mm -hmm. Is this Dr. Strange, Mr. Norell or Dr. Dr. Norell and Mr. Mm -hmm. Strange? Yeah. One of yeah. Those? But fantastic. I, I would have to look it up. I'm going to I'm gonna yeah. convince myself not to do it. But yeah, I know what book you're talking about. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I do. I have read that. I have not read the other book you mentioned, but I have read that. And yeah. she, her it they fold back on themselves like her stories fold back on themselves so much it's yeah it's yeah, an interesting really well it's an interesting approach i know the, i haven't because of the podcast i haven't got to read a lot of fiction lately um i did yeah. just read our lady of the dark country written by sylvia linstead who i guess is kind of our neighbor she's in this part of the world too oh. and um oh, brilliant beautiful writing but I read it with a book group nice. and some people really had a hard time getting in because she does write. Mm. Her writing style is so poetic mm. that if you're not used to reading that kind of like almost myth making writing that almost sounds like fairy tale, it, it's, yeah. it's a little hard to get into. But once you're in there, like, yeah, her writing is just beautiful. So Nice. I've been finding myself recently, <clears throat> so, you know, there's a question that goes around, and I think we've both blogged on this subject. Um, if you hang around any flavor of witches, pagans, druids, occult folks, um, you'll often hear, you know, like, what book should I start reading, right? What book should I read? And there's, you know, sort of uh, in, in general witchcraft or Wicca, there's, you know, a handful of authors that always get thrown out there, and many of those books are... 30, 40, 50 years old now, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and that not that there's not value in reading them. There absolutely is. But the world is very different from, you know, um, the, the times of uh, the spiral dance and drawing down the moon, for instance, right, that were written in the late 70s. Uh, things have changed. A lot of the Scott Cunningham books, Scott Cunningham was brilliant. And a lot of that information is really dated now, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting what I have found myself reading um, is less overtly pagan books, you know, books by witches and pagans, and more books about the things that generally we ascribe to. So I've, I, over the past year, I've read a Robert McFarlane book about walking. It's a book called The Old Ways, mm -hmm. stunning book. Uh, um, and I am, uh, I read a book 
um, about uh, stone formations throughout the world, like different layers of stones. Phenomenal book. I've read uh, The Entangled Web, which is all about mushrooms and the mycelial layer, but from a, not a very romantic perspective, but from a very sort of scientific mm -hmm. perspective. So I find myself right now reading a lot of essays. There was one that I read that was called Birdsong in the Year of Silence, and it was written in the first year in England of the COVID pandemic, when everything was quiet because people weren't driving and lockdown in England was very, very severe. And, and so all of a sudden, people could hear birdsong for the first time or noticed it. Um, and this this book, uh, again, it, it's mm -hmm. absolutely beautifully written. And it's only, I don't know, 150, 200 pages, something like that. But I'm finding myself reading books about human beings' experiences of the natural world or environment that they find themselves in. Um, so whether it's sort of the tra travel essay style or or um, memoirs, almost. I read Celtic Tides, which is about a person that circumambulates <laughs> Ireland. Um, I've been reading and watching documentaries on the uh, Camino de Santiago, the you know five hundred mile pilgrimage through Spain. Mm -hmm. um, stunning. So those are the kind of things that I've been reading, along with these sort of lovely summer fling books. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know anybody yeah, who hasn't read stunning. Robert McFarlane. I totally recommend like just beautiful work. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And oh, who is the other woman who wrote the salt path about her? What is her name? I can't think of her name. Anyway, also her books. <laughs> I'll have to think of it, but I'll <laughs> put a link. I, in. I don't know that one. The salt yeah, path. She's, now also, she's also, I think she's English as well. And um, her husband was really ill. And so they just, they basically sold everything and like walked the coast um, wow. and he got better. And then she's got another two mm. books kind of about their life after that. And, um, but my sister is planning on doing Santiago. And so I've been sending her walking books. So I sent her the uh. Salt path and I was like, oh, I need to send her some Robert McFarlane. So that's probably going to be my next package to her. <laughs> so. Do you know how I learned about that? Like, you know, we learn about things in interesting ways. So there is an Irish musician by the name of Glenn Hansard. Um, and he's an acoustic musician. Mm -hmm. He's absolutely fabulous. He's very sort of troubadourish or bardic. Uh, he was <laughs> a busker on the streets of uh, Dublin for many years. And uh, he was in The Commitments, uh, the movie that came out in the 90s about the Irish, you know, uh, band. And One of my and, favorite um, movies to this day. Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, he was the guitarist. And um, so we saw him in concert. A friend of ours said, do you want to come and see this Irish guy? And we're like, yeah, sure. So off we went to go <laughs> see this concert, funnily enough, down in, in San Jose. And he was about to sing a song, and he told the story of the song. And the story of the song is that uh, when he got to be 50-ish years old, there were a group of men who followed in the ancient Celtic tradition of rowing all around Ireland in a, a cora, traditional boat, and they would go around Ireland, across the English Channel, down to France, all the way down into Spain, and then they would carry this cara along the, the uh, Camino de Santiago, right? So it was this amazing track that had been done by monks for centuries. And so this group of men decided to do it. Well, it took them three years. They did it, um, and one of the men got sick, and so Glenn Hansard was able to take his place. And so he tells this story. And then one of the men who was kind of the leader of this expedition on another trip that they were on drowned, which was beautifully poetic. Um, you know, he had said that, um, you know, we borrow time from the sea or something very poetic like that. And so he wrote this song in remembrance of this person. And I thought, well, that's quite interesting. What's this Camino that he's talking about? And then I have gone down the rabbit hole. I've watched so many documentaries on it and read so many stories of people writing it. It's wonderful. And I think pilgrimage, 
pilgrimage is another amazing topic that we might also write a book about. <laughs> I was going to say, um, I feel like just, there's a book thread coming in here somewhere. <laughs> we don't talk about pilgrimage much in no, Canada. especially Americans because it's. You know, I, we, we traveled to the UK in 2005 and we stayed at a, a bed and breakfast and there was a, a very posh, older British woman at breakfast and she was going on about how Americans don't travel and that's why, you know, we're Americans or whatever, you know, and I get it. Like, I understand the hatred for Americans, but I was like, do you understand your entire country could fit three times in the state that I live in? Like, that's why Americans don't travel. It's far and it's expensive, mm-hmm. you know, so. So it's and and I think we also take for granted the sacredness of the land we live on. Like it's not just in England. Stonehenge isn't the only sacred place. There's all this sacredness right here. Yeah. So it is a very interesting topic, but I think I've got sassy feelings about it. <laughs> well, I'm rightly sassy feelings. I remember the first time I traveled in Europe and was trying to explain to people that I was from Tennessee. They were like, Oh, have you been to New York? And I was like, No. And then have you been to Los Angeles? No. Right. And I was like, it's almost easier for me to come here than go to LA. Like that's how far away. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. But we did spend, you know, I think again, a lot of folks and I'm really overgeneralizing here, but it often seems that at virtually every pagan event that you might go to festival conference, you know, there's always someone whose topic is, you know, my adventures at Stonehenge, my adventures at Newgrange, you know, something like mm-hmm. that. And uh, so we often think, you know, I, I think we tend to look to Europe in general, and, and I would say the British Isles probably more so, because of places like Stonehenge and Avebury and um, uh, Silbury Hill and, and and Tara and, you know, all these amazing places. And I think because the U.S. has got a, a challenging relationship with the last 300 years of history and obliterating what was here beforehand, you mm-hmm. know, there isn't. There are very, very few places in the U.S. where there's a, you know, a, a First Nations uh, village monument sacred site that's, you know, three, four, five, ten thousand years old because they've been obliterated. Right. Uh, and yeah. so I think, you know, there's a difference there as well. But yeah, now I'm getting all juicy about thinking about <laughs> pilgrimages. Pil- pil- I will, I will be so excited if a book on pilgrimage comes out of this podcast. That would be <laughs> super <laughs> exciting. Yeah, that's my list. <laughs> I think you'd need to get a really big advance on that book so you could travel. <laughs> yes. Excellent plan. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I see. We have kitty shenanigans. <laughs> Yeah, he's about to get thrown out of the office. <laughs> he's very so old. Cute. He's 15 and no. he's not well. So it's hard to get no. mad at him. So Yeah. But he is spoiled broad. So um <laughs> but I I like I, I feel like I don't know, just the fact that you brought up the advance for like the book to travel, like it does kind of like I do wonder how many books don't get written because of extenuating circumstances like that. Like you have this idea and you need to travel or you need to have access to this certain thing to write it. And I do wonder like how much of that we miss out on, like not just in in pagan space, but like in the wider world of of books and publishing and and writers, like how much of that we miss out on. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's fascinating, right? Um, uh, A dear friend of ours, um wrote a book several years ago where they had access to some very rare existing documents from the 9th 10th and 11th century um but um they had to you know go in and have the white gloves and the manuscript and uh, you know somebody had to turn the pages for them and they were written in a language that they understood um I certainly don't have that kind of access, you know? No. Um, and so it is fascinating. I do think about that. Um, and, you know, there have also been uh, authors in history, um, you know, think about Walden Pond, you know, that was written about one particular place, you know, uh, Emerson. And, and um, so, yeah, I think, 
Um, yeah, I, wouldn't it be lovely if we all had the ability to get up and travel and go anywhere we want and write about what we want? The writing about what we want is relatively easy. The getting to places is a little yeah. bit more challenging. Yeah. Well, and I think, I mean, I think about that, and this is maybe a question for you all as a couple who both write, like part of being able to write is making space for that. Like I think a lot about like, I don't know, Tony Morrison who had a nine to five job for years and wrote in the morning and look at what we are able to enjoy because she was able to find that space, but how many people can't find that space. So how do you all Mm -hmm. make space for that, for yourselves and for each other in your life? It's kind of, it's kind of easy for me. I don't know if easy is the right word, but I, once I have a deadline, then all bets are off. So, you know, if there, if I don't have a deadline then it's never going to happen. So that's kind of the, that's been the line in the sand for me is once there, once I've made an official agreement to do something by this time, then I must do it. And I won't let anything else get in the way. Like I'll stay up till midnight. I won't talk to anybody for days. I will forget to eat. I won't go to the bathroom. Like, this is all true. yeah, <laughs> I will encourage everyone else to take care of things or beg other people to take care of things so that I can just get this thing done because it must be done by this moment. And I, you know, procrastinate a bit too. So I often put myself in these situations where I don't need to be working until midnight, (laughs) but I waited too long and now I must, you know? So I think that that is the way it works for me is that I, once the deadline is set, I will do whatever it takes to make it happen. The downside is if there's no deadline, then it never happens. I think an interesting thing for you as well, Phoenix, is that you don't have a traditional nine to five job. No. So Phoenix owns uh, her own business. We co-own a shop, but Phoenix really is the 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 face and the brains behind it. Yeah. Um, I mean, the and- good side of that is I, I create my own hours. The bad side of that is sometimes that's 24 of them, four days in a row, you know? So it just depends on what's going on in the world and at the shop. Yeah. And it's interesting because I haven't made the time. So there's this thing, I think, funnily enough, it may have been Stephen King that says, you know, he gets up every day and writes a thousand words or 5,000 words or whatever the number is. And I have on a whiteboard behind me, it says writers write a thousand words per day. So what that has told me is I'm not really a very good writer. Um, (laughs) But I got out of the habit of writing. So for me, I blogged for six years. And for that time period, I blogged, generally speaking, once a week. And at one point, I was blogging in two different places. So for an hour a week, 90 minutes, two hours, something like that, I would sit down and say, what's this topic I'm going to write about? Or I'd read something online that would spark my interest, and I'd write about it. So I was very much in the habit of writing every day because of the demands of my job where I am looking at images and content and designing web pages. The last thing that I want to do at the end of the day is sit in front of a computer and write. So I am curious to look at other processes to write. Um, I've really toyed with the idea of Um, dictating to myself because there are a thousand moments during the day where I have a conversation in my head or even out loud while I'm in the shower or in the car where I have this great idea, this brilliant paragraph, this engaging, provoking thought process, and I can say it out loud. And then often I get in front of the computer and I go, what the fuck was that? Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I'm really curious about dictating and transcribing. Because for me, I can just, quite frankly, talk to myself, which I'm good at. <laughs> yeah, which have, is your favorite thing to do? It is my favorite <laughs> thing to do, apart from have, cooking and eating. Yeah, I have a really good friend. He she takes her morning walk, and she dictates, she writes fiction, and she dictates, and then she comes back, and uh, you know, basically the reviewing the transcript because she uses a you know voice to text program reviewing that as like the first edit kind of thing. And Mm. she started because she has very bad carpal tunnel syndrome. And now she writes so much faster with it that even though she might be able to go back to typing, she's continued to do it that way. Wow. 
That's I think that's cool. a really good strategy for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also, I, also, I mean, writing longhand, write. but it's really hard on you if you're not used to writing longhand. Oh my gosh. A dear friend of ours writes all of their books longhand and I do not know how they do it. I've seen the journals and they are beautiful and magnificent. And my handwriting looks like a chicken was let loose in an ink pot and ran all over paper. Um, <laughs> so it, it's incredibly hard for me to write any more long, long form. Yeah. I do think dictating is, I think it also works with my style of, of writing. Yeah. Uh, because like I said, I, I write conversationally, I think. You should yeah. do it. Try it. I shall. Hey. There you go. Um, advice for folks listening to you if they're stuck. Um, yeah, no, I, uh, I, my feeling is however it happens, that works. Yeah. Make it work. Absolutely. And I will, I will argue a tiny bit with you that writers write a thousand words a day because I don't think that that um, allows for people to have lives. Sometimes you don't get yeah, a thousand words in. And sometimes you write, I mean, some people can only write on the weekend or, you know, I, I don't know. I feel like, um, you know, all advice is probably good advice for somebody and all advice is probably terrible yeah. advice for somebody. That's exactly so. right. Absolutely. And it's also a combination of things. When I wrote The Magic of Food, I had some blogs that I used as the foundation of, of some portions of that book. I absolutely dictated parts of that book. Um, and I even paid Phoenix to write some parts of the book. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um, I had the idea, but I would literally like, because I just could not get the things out of my head through my hands in a cogent way. I literally paid Phoenix to sit there and I just spoke and she wrote. And, and the only work I mean, is not even a full chapter, but there was just one little portion that I was just completely stuck and thought, I'm going to try something else. Um, and like, to be clear, the writing process for me is cathartic and agonizing. Um, it was the same when I was writing music when I was younger. I was a lead singer in a band and and I was mostly the lyricist as well. And it was the same thing. I would have these ideas where I'd have one word or one phrase that would just plague my mind and I couldn't write anything else around it. And then eventually I did. Um, you know, because the, the right situation, the muse came back, the, um, you know, my, my Damon sat on my shoulder and said, quick, get this out, you know? Um, and, um, so yeah, I, for me, it's a combination of all things, all ways of, of getting the idea out of my head and onto paper. Um, I think are good. Yeah. I wish, I wish I were like Phoenix that could just sit down have a full blown conversation with me <laughs> and type 5,000 words. It's not quite like that, but yeah, Imagine. that sounds cool. <laughs> hey, whatever, whatever works. Right. Um, so <laughs> I suspect that the three of us could sit here and talk about writing until the middle of next week. Um, in the Probably. interest of trying to keep the podcast under an hour, I don't think that's going to happen this time. Uh, I am going to uh, suggest we move on to the game of chance portion of the podcast. Oh, yes. But before that, I wanted to give you guys an opportunity to let people know where to find you and if you have anything coming up that you want to plug. So the best way to find us, uh, you can find us at The Witches Next Door. That's both the name of our website. It's also the name of our podcast. So you can find that in all the places that you can find podcasts. Uh, Phoenix, where can they find you? Uh, phoenixlefay.com l-e-f-a-e uh, I, ha I do have a weekend retreat coming up in April that uh, is going to be fun we're hoping to be at Mystic South so we'll, we, that's not 100% confirmed at this point but we are it's a, a likely a likely thing I believe um, and I don't have much planned beyond that <laughs> what books do you have coming out? Oh yeah, I, well the the next book that's out, which I just found out apparently is already in the Llewellyn Warehouse, which is very very early. Um, but it's called The Witch's Guide to Creating and Performing Rituals. I think it's a really long title, and I keep forgetting. What was the name the that you wanted to call it? For I wanted it to be called A Witch's Guide to Creating Rituals That Don't Suck, but they wouldn't go with the don't suck part. 
they didn't like that. Mm-hmm. So fortunate. Um, I, I did happen. A little bird sent me a e galley or a galley of your book, so I did get to read it and nice. I thoroughly enjoyed it. So, oh, good. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I do think it, it is a nice companion piece with life ritualized. Yeah. They they are a nice yeah. companion piece to read together. Um. Okay. So. Phoenix has, has done this. I said, Wayne, I will tell you the, the rules of the snow rules game is that I'm going to roll a die. And depending on what I roll, you will get a question about death, sex, religion, politics, or money. And if I roll a six, you get to pick which one. Um, okay. You can always say pass. <laughs> like I said, there's not really any rules. And you can either both answer the same question or you can get your own questions. Oh, I like our own questions. What do you think? Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, Gwen, since you have not got to do this, we'll start with you and then we'll have Phoenix do her question. Okay. Two, sex. Ah. I knew you were going to get sex. (laughs) An excellent topic. Yes. So uh, I've I've reread your Magic of Food book for the podcast. And I have recently read two of... uh, Phoenix's books. And so you all do write about sex and sex magic in your books. And I was wondering as a couple, and this is one of those things you don't want to share. So you can always pass. <laughs> um, so what is recipe and spell testing like at your house? <laughs> well, uh, I will tell you. So um, when it comes to uh, recipes, I love cooking sensual foods i think eating is a sensual act literally by definition we use our senses right when we eat so i am constantly trying to come up with recipes that that, um how should we say delicately peak phoenix's interest (laughs) um and uh so i'm constantly looking at colors of food shapes of food um, my favorite thing in the world is to eat with my hands, which is not Phoenix's favorite thing in the world. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there are some dishes that I would say um, when it comes to food magic, I'm definitely experimental. And when it comes to um, spell testing, we test them vigorously and frequently. <laughs> excellent answer it's an excellent answer uh, so Phoenix, do you want to weigh in on that or would you like your own question no i'll do my own question okay or politics yeah <laughs> would you like a different one you can pick a different oh no okay. oh, oh that's good for me so i guess so we talked about this a little bit and you talk about this in in the book that you wrote together about, you know, kind of the debate of writing together. And mm-hmm. I wondered, and now we know that you also don't have similar reading habits. Um, if and when you diverge on political or philosophical things, how do you all handle that, that debate? And what is there like one thing in particular that is like the hot button topic? <laughs> Uh, we don't honestly we don't diverge that much on political and social topics and i think that it would be really hard for me to be in a relationship with someone that i wasn't in pretty good alignment with in those regards like i'm pretty i i'm pretty liberal <laughs> like i'm on the liberal side of liberal um and I don't think Gwen's quite as liberal as I am. He does still some have, have some of that like supports the British monarchy shenanigans going on <laughs> in his heart. But um, <laughs> I think for the most part, we are enough on the same page that it doesn't cause conflict. Because if it if it was a serious conflict, I don't know that I could be in a relationship. Like I'm that hardcore about the way I lean politically and socially. And I, I think that's also part of, you know, be, practicing witchcraft and being a pagan and sort of being in this world. I know there are definitely conservative folks in our traditions, but I think that's more rare. Uh, and so I appreciate that we are on the same page with things like that. And, you know, Guyan is not an American citizen. So there's also a little bit of me when I'm being a shit that if he starts getting feelings on American politics, I'll be like, you don't get to say anyway. So be quiet, Brit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Some that um, taxation without representation thing sucks, though. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, you know, honestly, that is probably where we can get a little saucy with each other is, you know, uh, some of the ways that Brits look at the world is a little it's it's different than the way Americans look at the world. And occasionally he'll say something that I just find so imperialist. that I'm like, what is wrong with you? And I think it's just because I am so left leaning mm-hmm. and his perspective is a little bit different because he comes from a different country. Uh, my favorite thing to say to British friends when they bitch about America is we learned it from you. <laughs> and the thing we like That's to say one. back is you're petulant teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> when your no country's argument. been around for another no three or five hundred years, then complain. <laughs> yeah, no argument. No argument on the petulant teenagers. But okay, so I, I am going to break my own rules of this game that doesn't have any rules. So I wrote this other question for you all and you didn't get it. So I'm going to ask you anyway, because I'm really curious about that answer. Um, So Mm -hmm. I was thinking about like, I do feel like it is kind of rare in pagan witchy spaces for couples necessarily to both be like, I feel like a lot of people in this pit are in mixed relationships (laughs) with people who are not practicing or don't, or have another religion. And then also to be, creative partners as well so i was wondering if there Mm -hmm. are like i don't know in your mighty dead saints whatever if you have like creative couples in the past that you two look to as like i don't know inspiration not necessarily veneration but maybe just inspiration yeah that's a really good question i think the there's a couple couples pagany couples that have sort of been when you think of them you usually think of the other one you know probably victor and cora anderson are the ones that come up first in my mind and um you know and and what is remembered lives i specifically mentioned victor and cora anderson and i wrote about them as a couple instead of individuals uh and i don't know that i necessarily aspire to be like victor and cora anderson i have sassy feelings about that that we could talk at a different point in time about (laughs) um but i definitely think that they you know they created a lineage they they um were very open and public about who they were and the way they practiced and their lives and i feel like that's that's how we try to to live in our relationship and our spirituality like we're very open about it and we're very um willing to share and and so i feel like that's probably the my first go-to mighty dead type couple i think raven and stephanie gramasi would probably be another good Absolutely. couple to aspire to be you know so yeah i think you know the thing that it was interesting when we first really started getting involved with a larger pagan community than just our small little one was running into so many poly groups and being like oh actually you know yes we're a queer couple but we're a monogamous queer couple so that's been an interesting road to travel as well uh you know so yeah i think that there's a whole long conversation there about being a pagan couple in the pagan world yeah 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 i think it's interesting um you know i i one of the other mighty dead that come to mind uh um uh, gerald gardner and doreen valiente right because they were kind of the the mum and dad of the of the Wiccan <laughs> tradition, right, and mm-hmm. certainly of Gardnerian Wicca, um, and you know there have been. We did a series of pictures at the beginning of the pandemic, so about three years ago now, because we were bored out of our skulls. Yeah. So we recreated some famous pictures uh, and sort of modernized them and made them silly. So there's this picture of me dressed up as Gerald Gardner. Um, and uh, the very, this very famous shot where he's in a circle and he's got a sword and he's sort of poking it at a monkey with a book in his hand. So we recreated that. And Phoenix recreated a picture of herself as Doreen Valiente. And then we created a picture of ourselves as uh, as Alex and Maxine Sanders, you know. So um, just And then Maxine Sanders friended me on Facebook. It's right. <laughs> oh, it was, nice. It was lots of fun. Uh, so... <laughs> You know, I think some of those kind of early foundational folks, Victor and Cora, as, as Phoenix mentioned, but I yeah. also think I look around the community, and in our case, there are lots of couples, uh, not just couples that um, appear heterosexual, heterosexual like we are, but there's a ton of couples around um, of all various ages and shapes and 
configurations that are just beautiful that we see year after year after year, people that have been in relationships with each other for 30 and 40 years and they manage to make it work and, and are both practicing pagans. And so I think there, there's not much paid attention to that in our community, but there are some mm -hmm. amazing uh, couples and throuples and uh, more than that, um, yeah. but folks that make their relationship work are much more interested in, how people make their relationship work, regardless of the configuration of the yeah. you know mm -hmm. parts and people that make that relationship up. Yeah, same, same, same. Yeah. Also, being in a queer couple that looks straight and is monogamous. <laughs> so. yeah. Straight. Yeah, it's a whole thing. Yeah. Whole thing. Yeah. So. Well, cool. Well, thank you both for your time and for yeah. just you know your candor and all that. I really appreciate it. It was great to talk to you. Thanks. This is one of my favorite interviews because it's just us, you know, chatting about what we do. And I really love that. So Aww, it didn't well, feel like you. a plug for a book, which I love. Aww, thanks, Although so speaking of which, Phoenix's new book. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Yes. That's why I always leave room for plugging because, I mean, you know, we got to pay the bills, right? Sell the books. So <laughs> right. awesome. Well, thank you both. And um, thank you. Hopefully this will come out pretty soon. But uh, for folks listening, um, you will get another taste of Phoenix because she and I are going to talk about drawing down the moon. So that's right. Awesome. Yeah, it'll be fun. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Which Lit is a production of Thousand Volt Press. Our intro music is Cosmic Glow by Andrew K. And our outro music is Voices by Alexander Shinekar. Transcripts and all our previous episodes are available at witchlitpod.com. And you can follow us on Instagram at witchlitpod. Thanks for listening and for reading Witchy.